uh, Professor Sam Peltzman, who is at the same time professor of the University of Chicago School, Booth School of Business. Um, uh, Professor Feldsman is um, known as an expert uh, on regulatory and voting behavior and uh, he is one of the few economists and uh, even the only regulatory economics who has a effect who uh, is named after Professor Peltzman, which is Peltzman effect. So we are proud to have him today and uh, hear from him uh, about his uh, research, his analysis, who uh, in uh, encompass um, several uh, topics which are highly interesting uh, for Georgian audience too, which is uh, uh, pharmaceutical innovation, which is public uh, education, and which is financial regulation. So these topics are really very interesting for our audience. So I'm really proud to have you here. And Professor Pilsman here is Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Or do I have to use this? Is this better? No. Switch it on. How's this? Okay, so uh, uh, the talk is titled. But first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here, uh, to be invited to the free university and to, to learn about everything that uh, positive that's going, uh, that's, uh, going on here. I can't begin to cover all of the topics that uh, were in the introduction. So uh, 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 the first talk is going to be a, a general and specific. Uh, you heard about the Peltzman effect. That, that will come in here a little bit. Uh, the general uh, topic is regulation and the wealth of nations. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, and it says the connection between economic uh, government regulation and economic progress. So uh, let me start with a summary of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, uh, it's about economic regulation and economic progress. Uh, the title, Wealth of Nations, right away tells you the, something about uh, uh, where I'm starting, which is Adam Smith, the, the author of the Wealth of Nations. I'll start with him, uh, and then I'm going to uh, uh, try to show uh, something that he didn't cover. He has a very skeptical view about the role of regulation. Now, I want to argue that things are more complicated than what you'll find in The Wealth of Nations, the book. Uh, the complications are that market forces affect the outcome of regulation. It's not just the other way. Uh, econo and also, economic progress sometimes makes it hard to see the effects of regulation. And I'll, I'll try to show why that's the case. Let me begin with an apology. Uh, I'm going to give some examples of the, uh, uh, the points that I'm going to, to make. They're uh, mostly U.S. examples. Uh, and they, they implicitly come from the U.S. regulatory and legal system. People in this part of the world have had a history uh, that's a little bit different than ours, and I can only hope that some of what I say about the American experience resonates with you, carries over to your own experience in, uh, in uh, this country. Having some technological problems here. Does anybody know how to get rid of this? Uh... Thank you. Okay, so let me start with Adam Smith, uh, who's, I say, the skeptic in this story. Uh, Smith's uh, main interest is called the wealth of nations. His great book is called The Wealth of Nations. 
his, his main interest is in the question of why some economies grow and others don't. He, he, uh, he explicitly deals with this only in the third book in The Wealth of Nations. There's a lot of it implicit in the first two books. He gets to the third book and he says, what is it that leads nations to grow? And he emphasizes what he calls natural progress. The first chapter of the third book is a a book, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's entitled the, the Natural Progress of Opulence. Uh, even to a native English speaker, that's a strange formulation. But what it really is, is opulence means wealth and natural progress. He's, he's emphasizing uh, what are the things that, basically he's saying, what are the things that make countries grow 1% per year, compounded for a hundred years. What makes them progressive countries in that sense? And he says, he's talking here about, specifically about the, the uh, allocation of capital and uh, 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 savings. And he says that natural progress occurs if a society invests first in its agricultural sector, and then as the agricultural sector develops more fully, then and only then does it allocate substantial amounts of capital to uh, industry and trade. And then he, his argument is that if left alone, this is the natural part, if left alone, market forces would actually bring this about. And he has in numerous examples of uh, societies which left things alone, and this is what happened. At least that's his claim. Uh, uh, and then he goes on and he says, let's look at the world today. That is to say, 230 years uh, ago or so. And he says, this natural order of things is entirely inverted. And why is that? Simple. It's those regulators in London who were messing things up. Were it not for them, we would have this, what he calls this natural, this natural progress. So he's the skeptic. He, he's saying that, that regulation basically interferes with market forces and reduces economic progress. That's his, that's his big conclusion. That's what he's famous for. Most of my talk is about the complications. Two of them that I mentioned in the introduction. Market forces also can work against regulation. And progress, natural or otherwise, can hide the true costs of regulation. Let me start with the first one, which I'll spend, I think, most of my time on. Uh, and it's where this so-called Peltzman effect uh, uh, comes in. Uh, uh, I'm flattered that it's called the Peltzman effect, but I think of it as the thing you learn in the first week of a basic economics course, uh, 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 just applied to a particular area. Uh, I'm going to emphasize what's been called offsetting behavior. And what is this all about? What, what market forces are leading to this kind of a behavior? Well, think about what regulation does in essence, in essence, what regulation is doing is trying to suppress the outcome of some market forces. These forces would lead to a certain outcome. The government says that's not a good outcome. We have to somehow sit on these market forces and prevent that outcome from happening. Okay? But it doesn't eliminate the forces that's producing those ads, just trying to suppress them. Because though, whatever incentives were leading to the behavior that the regulator is trying to change still are there, you have to ex expect that the private actors are going to do things 
that reduce the effectiveness of the regulation. And that's what offsetting behavior really is. It's the private actors responding to the regulation in ways that reduce its effectiveness. And I'm going to give three examples from, uh, again, they're, they're, they're both, they're all three of them are from U.S. experience and regulation, but as I think you'll see, this experience and this regulation has counterparts uh, uh, in many uh, places. The first is going to be automobile regulation, which is the specific application which uh, you think about when my name gets mentioned in connection with offsetting behavior. Uh, the second and third have nothing to do with any work that I did, but the principle is the same. Ha have to do with, uh, the second one has to do with employment regulation and the third with environmental regulation. Uh, specifically disabled workers and uh, uh, endangered uh, species. And I'm going to pick these three examples because they've been studied by economists and I'm going to try to convey to you in very summary form what economists think they've learned about these kinds of regulation. So let's start with automobile safety regulation. Again, this is the U.S. history. Uh, it spreads to the rest of the world. Uh, we have uh, the, the regulatory uh, break occurs in the middle 1960s, almost 50 years ago now. Uh, before that, uh, uh, you could think of automobile safety as an example of natural progress. Market forces basically were determining the level of safety that uh, was being produced uh, with respect to automobile safety. Uh, and it was progressive. There were many small changes overall leading to a steady decline in uh, 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 risk. Uh, it wasn't just market forces, government had its role. They built the highways, they passed legislation to govern driving, the police enforced that legislation, and the courts enforced it, and so forth. And uh, throughout this period of kind of market forces complemented by some government role, the death rate is gradually declining. Here's a picture of, of, the, of the facts. These are, this is the facts of the case. You can see it starts in 1925 when in the U.S. automobiles first became a mass-produced consumer item in, back in the 1920s. The death rate is, is more or less, it fluctuates, but you can see it's declining. Uh, and this particular picture stops in 1960, which is just before the government got into the business of regulating this process. Uh, it's declining at an, uh, 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 a rate of 3.5% per year. And I want you all to remember that number. Minus 3.5% per year. Just remember it for about 20 minutes. Well, apparently this isn't good enough. That, again, that's the... The premise of all regulation is that whatever these market, whatever market forces are that you're going to ultimately regulate, they're not producing a desirable outcome. So we got the National Highway Traffic Safety Act of 1966. Basically, it said that automobile design is now going to become regulated by the federal government in the, in the United States. Every car sold in the United States market had to come with a specified list of devices. The first, this is, this is an ongoing program. Every year there are new specifications. The first generation was simply that cars had to be equipped with seat belts, with steering wheels that went this way when there was an accident instead of remaining rigid, windshields that went that way instead of uh, 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 remaining rigid, and so on. There's a whole list of, uh, that, that gets longer and longer 
uh, o over time. Uh, uh, so so uh, I'm talking about offsetting behavior. How do market forces offset this regulation? Well, uh, here's the basic logic of offsetting behavior in this case. Let's think about a seat belt or a uh, steering column that doesn't injure you anymore. N none of those things make an accident less likely to happen. What they do is they tell you that if you get into an accident, you're going to be less damaged. It's not going to be as bad as it would have been without these devices. Okay? There's a rational response to that information. If somebody says, if you get into an accident, that you're not going to have as bad consequences, this is just like the price of something got reduced in the store. You have to, it costs you less to do things that lead to an accident. So you have to expect the rational response, as I said, you learn it in the first week of, the, of an introductory economics class. The rational response when something costs you less is you do more of it, you buy more of it. In this case, the kind of behavior that leads to accidents. So uh, what, what, have, what is going to be the effect on safety? I mean, that's the goal. That's the ultimate goal. Well, safety is the product of two things. The severity of an accident, what happens when there's an accident, and the number of accidents. Okay? Uh, regulation is reducing the first of these, but it's going to lead to a rational response which increases the second, so you can't tell. You can't tell from basic theory whether this kind of regulation will increase or decrease safety. It's going to push one aspect toward safety, but it's going to lead to behavior which leads to less safety. The, the real question here is not the economic uh, logic of offsetting behavior, but how important it is. And that's, uh, that's something that economic theory can't answer. In principle, you can show that what the theory can say is very weak. It can say the offset can be just a little bit. It can be complete in the sense that there's no effect on safety. It can even be more than complete so that you end up with less safety. In fact, I'll give you an example in which there's a more than complete offset. Not, not here, but later on in, in this uh, talk. Uh, there's a lot of academic studies which try to estimate what this effect is. Mine was the first. You see, if you're an old guy like me, and you hang around long enough, you can get an effect named after you. Right? My, I was the first one who looked into it. Uh, uh, in that, in, 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 that's back 40 years now, almost 40 years, and I was looking at just the first generation of these devices, and I found that the offset was complete. What happened was that the people inside cars, their death rate went down, total accidents went up, and uh, the the resulting increase in deaths to non-occupants, pedestrians, people in, in other vehicles that, uh, that were struck by uh, a vehicle, that kind of thing, offset completely the safety benefits from these uh, uh, devices. Now, I would also not have an effect named after me if that was the last word, but it, it wasn't. The, good, the, the goal of every economist is not to have an effect named after oneself, but to do work that other economists will question and extend 
and apply to, in this case, other devices, other countries. This is a case where it's, we don't have evidence just from U.S. experience. We've had uh, uh, well over uh, 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 30 years of academic studies that uh, 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 basically look at the same question. And let me try to summarize that 30-year project. Most of them do not find complete offset the way I did. I have to be honest about that. My sometimes they do, in, depending on the context, but uh, uh, most do not. But most do find partial offset, often substantial. I'll, I'll fast forward 30 years to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the la one of the uh, 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 the later studies, two economists named Cohen and Einov, uh, uh, published 2003. They're looking at not the devices but uh, seatbelt use laws. Uh, so uh, what happened? Uh, as you had, these laws have spread all over the world. Uh, they didn't even start in the in the United States, but. Uh, uh, at some point, the regulators were saying, well, it's not enough to put the seatbelts in the car. People are not using them enough. We have to regulate now the use of seatbelts, not just the in installation. Uh, all over the United States, they spread these laws which uh, 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 find you uh, 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 and took away driving privileges and so forth if you didn't wear the seatbelts. Cohen and I have found that those laws, first of all, did improve the wearing of seatbelts, had that effect. That's the pro-safety effect. Uh, they found that on balance, death rates decreased, unlike my original study where they, they did, nothing happened, basically. But they found that the decrease was only one-third as much as you would expect from estimates of what the safety benefits are, right? So it, it's very important, by the way, every time I, I talk about this, very important for you people to wear your seatbelt. There is no doubt that if you get into an accident, you're better off wearing a seatbelt. And there's a lot of evidence on that. It's evidence that, for example, Cohen and I have used to come up with the conclusion that the, there's a two-thirds offset, that one-third of the maximum benefit is being uh, 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 realized. We know pretty much what the, set, what the estimated benefit per use is. It's quite substantial. What they find, however, is that out there in the world, the actual benefit is one-third as much which implies a two-thirds offset. So that's typical of this, of this uh, literature. So that's one example. Let me give you a second example, which goes in a much different area of regulation. This is employment of the disabled. This is a law passed in the United States in 1992. Uh, uh, it's spread, again, this is not just in the United States now, there are laws like this all over the world. I would not be a bit surprised if uh, your friends in the European Union are pressuring you folks to have such a law if you don't have one, or that you have one already. The 1992 law in the United States, which I mentioned because the academic studies, which I'm going to talk about, are estimating the effect of this law uh, is very typical of this kind of legislation. It says you cannot discriminate in hiring people, in paying them, in promoting them, or dismissing them based on disability status. Okay, so we also have laws that say the same thing about race and gender, and this one applies to this disability status. Also, you have to, it's called reasonable accommodation, you have to make a reasonable accommodation 
for disabled workers. You have to design the workplace so that it's accessible and easily used by handicapped employees. Okay? Let me start with the role of natural progress. I don't have a lot of uh, data to show you like I did with the automobiles. Uh, uh, but it's clear that opportunities for employing disabled people increase in, in uh, the world. Do you want to, if somebody who's raising his hand to ask a question, I'm very happy to have you interrupt. It's, uh, where I come from in Chicago, it's, it's part of the natural order of things for students to interrupt uh, lectures with questions. So feel free to do it here. I have no, no I know. I sit down. Okay. So uh, why, why do I say that natural progress is good for disabled workers? Well, the economy has been moving from producing things to producing services and information. And physical ability is less important. So just from that fact, you would think that the, 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 the problem has been getting better, but not better. Not like automobiles, not, not enough. Pass this law that says you have to do all these things. Now, what is the offsetting behavior by employers? Okay? Let me think, let's suppose I, I, I'm an employer, and I, my question is, should I hire George, who isn't disabled, or Georgia, who is disabled? See, in my country, Georgia is a girl's name, as well as the name of a country and also one of our 50 states is named Georgia, but this is Georgia the girl. There's a boy, George, and a girl, they come, they say, well, I want to work. Uh, and Georgia happens to be disabled. Okay. Before 1992, there was no particular law about this. It, it, uh, uh, in the American employment uh, uh, system, I can pay Georgia any wage that we mutually agree on. I can dismiss her at will. We have at will employment. If things don't work out, that's why you know, uh, I, can, I can make a bargain with Georgia, say, look, you're disabled. You might not be as productive as George. I'll pay you a little less and we'll see if things work out. You'll, it'll be fine. And if they don't work out, well, we'll have a parting of the ways, as we say. You'll have to go elsewhere for, to look for a job. After 1992, this things all change in very fundamental ways. If I hire Georgia, first of all, I can't pay her a lower wage. Cannot discriminate in pay based on disability status, even if she's not as productive. Uh, 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 and, uh, and the reasonable accommodation uh, uh, provision means that I may have to uh, incur other costs for, to comply with that provision of the law. And if I hire her, I can't fire her without risking a legal problem. Yes? Uh, in that case, uh, the situation becomes discriminating toward the George because he's getting lower pay for higher productivity. In a real sense, you're right, but that's the point. That's the point of the law. It doesn't want to have those differences. It means that the real cost of uh, uh, employing uh, Georgia per unit of her output is higher. And that's the point. That's where the, that's where the offsetting behavior uh, 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 comes in. The best thing for me to do is to make sure that Georgia never hears about this job, <coughs> hire George, and you avoid extra costs, per, especially, as you said, point out, per unit of output, and regulatory problems if things don't work out. Okay, so uh, again, the question now is, how important is this? This is the rational response to the higher cost of employing a disabled person is to employ less of them. That's the offsetting force. Right. We have two academic studies. I'm here as an academic economist just 
reporting what my colleagues have done. Uh, Tom Dallaire in 2000 and uh, Darren Asamolu and Josh Angris the year later. They're looking again at the first decade or so of experience with this, this law. And, and I don't know, uh, maybe time for other economists to look at whether, whether this, these results have held up. But they have very similar results. First of all, there are lower employment rates for disabled people after the war compared to the first. Secondly, as you would expect from this, this kind of analysis of the economic forces, it's coming about due to reduced new hires. It's employers, here's, here's Georgia out there, George in front of me, I'll grab George before Georgia hears about the job. So it's, it's in the new hiring decision that most of this effect occurs, and it's especially prominent for younger, less educated uh, workers where you don't have experience, you don't have the development of skills, which might be able to, uh, to uh, uh, in terms of productivity, offset the extra costs. So the, the young unskilled are particularly affected uh, by this. Uh, this is a case of more than 100% offset. The total hiring of disabled workers went down, not up as the nominal intent of the law would, uh, would uh, suggest. However, there are clear beneficiaries. Anybody who was already hired in 1992 got a bonus. You couldn't be fired. Your pay had to be, uh, 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 your pay was now regulated and, and uh, uh, so forth. So that's, that's my second example. The, the, the quickly, uh, how, much time, how much time should we uh, uh, allow for this? Till uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I hope that will be enough. Uh, if it, isn't, if it isn't, stick with me. We'll borrow it for the next one. Is this one uh, complete? Is this, is this on? Yes, okay. Well, let me talk about the endangered species law. It's this environmental or, or uh, 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 regulation of the of the habitat of threatened species. Endangered species law says uh, the government will, will, de will determine which animals and plants and uh, 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 bugs and things of that sort are threatened or endangered and make a list. Now, once, once a species is put on that list as uh, deemed to be endangered, the habitat can't be ha uh, altered to harm the species. Effectively, what this law does is it says if you have habitat for endangered species, you're a private property owner, and your property is endangered species habitat, you can't touch it. Basically, you have to leave it alone. Uh, uh, what's the purpose? Why pass this law? Well, this is taken from the regulatory agency's website. You want to make sure that these species are recovered. It's very clear. We want to put them on a list, do things that protect them, and ultimately take them off the list. The ESA is the Endangered Species Act. To shoot them down after the Huh? After they're off the list, they're not especially... Protected? Can you do? No, you can't. You, if you own the property, for sure you can't shoot them. You can't do anything that will harm the species. It really means that it has nothing to do with shooting. You can't build a house on that property because that damages habitat. You have to leave it in its natural state. What's happened? So what's happened? Quick. Lots of lists. Lots of animals are listed. Here's actually what the uh, what it looks like. That starts out with about 100 on the list in 1973. We now have 1,400. 
but this how many how many it says recovery is the go ultimate goal how many are recovered not many here's the facts over this whole period we have 1400 on the list 54 have been removed as of the start of this year 54 out of 1400 are off the list uh, of those 54 a third, if you look at the right hand, uh, 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 the 18 on the right hand, they were taken off because they were, put, they were wrongly put on in the first place. So that leaves about 36. Those 36, not all of them have recovered. 10 became extinct. 26 were recovered. 26 over this whole period out of 1,400. So, you know, that's, by, by that measure, this is, this is one of the least effective forms of regulation ever devised. It's a form of regulation which leads to big lists and very little else. Okay, what's the offsetting behavior that's at work here? Well, it's called preemptive development. It's talked about a lot there are a couple of academic studies. I'll review just one because we're running out of time. I'll tell you the story of the red cockaded woodpecker. Which is an article by Dean Look and Michael in 2003. I'm mentioning this particular species because it's been studied by these economists. So here is, here is, the, uh, here is the story of the red cockaded woodpecker. It lives in forests in the southern part of the United States that are commercial forests. Any co owner of a commercial forest has important decisions to make. When should I cut a tree? Now, let it grow, maybe later. How much should I cut? There's what we call clear cutting, where the answer is you cut everything down, and there is a, a thinning where you, you selectively cut down a tree here and there and you let the uh, forest remain uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a thinner state. And uh, should I replant the trees that I cut? Whether I clear cut them or thin them out, you have to decide should I uh, just leave things the way they are or should I, uh, should I replant trees? Okay, uh, 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 you're not going to be able to do any of this if your land is declared habitat. It's a problem. I see these birds fly around. Yes. Why would one buy such a land in the first place? Oh no! Wait a minute. They fly around. <clears throat> they live in these forests, but not in every forest. So what happens is uh, there's a bird, it's five miles away. It's a red cockaded woodpecker. It's on the endangered species list. You have a forest. And you heard that the bird set up a nest five miles down the road. What do you do if it's nearby? All the answers, very clear. When should I cut? Right now. How much should I cut? All of it. Quick. Should I replant or shouldn't I replant? Well, what's the point of replanting if the bird is going <laughs> to nest in my tree when I replant it? There's no point in it. So that's the preemptive development. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the story of the pygmy owl in Arizona. What Luke and Michael find is that this is exactly what happens. You get more. You get quicker cutting, more complete cutting, and no replanting. When you have land that is not yet habitat, but could become habitat. Okay, so here, this is, this is now uh, where it leads to a question. I, look, I gave you three examples of regulation. Sorry, does it mean that people are trying to clean their territory before it, this territory becomes uh, forbidden for? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Clean from the birds, from the 
You don't want the birds to build a nest on your land because then you cannot cut anything. That's the, the way the Endangered Species Act has been interpreted. Yes, before, you have to do it quickly. Very quickly, yes. So here I get automobile safety. What does it do? Well, it promotes reckless driving. Disabilities Act, supposed to increase employment, it increases unemployment among the disabled. And here's this Endangered Species Act, which is supposed to protect habitat, but ends up destroying it. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, 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 what's going, it's, in each case, the, the undesirable outcome is being produced by quite predictable offsetting behavior. Quite predictable. There's a basic economic logic leads you to all of these uh, 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 effects. Uh, and the question is, why are regulations like this politically popular? If, you, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I want to deal with that, with that, that question, and then I'll then I'll end the, the, the talk. And not just in the U.S. As I said, I have a very strong suspicion that you have a lot of these laws in your own country, and if you don't have them, the rest of the world is going to try to make you have them uh, to be a good world citizen. And why do we have this? Uh, and here's the second complication that I want to emphasize as kind of a possible answer. Uh, it, it has something to do with natural progress. Uh, uh, remember that three and a half percent. I, I asked you to remember a number. And why did I ask you? So I want to show you what, what happened after we started regulating this area. Here's a picture of what actually happened from 1965, when the law, the law just was about to be passed, to today, basically. And you see, things are getting safer. At what rate? Three and a half percent per year. Exactly the same. I mean, it didn't have to be exactly the same, but it was. There's ongoing progress, but at, and at a what rate? The same as there was before. It's as if you never had the regulation. You just have continued progress. Why did this happen? Well, it's a combination of what I've been talking about, which is offsetting behavior, and also the fact that in many cases, regulation is anticipating what would happen as a result of market forces. Yes. Go ahead, ask your question. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, uh, this uh, chart was about uh, number of tests, yeah? Do you have statistics for number of accidents? Yeah, I do, but not with me today. Yeah, but can you recall what was the picture? No. I, I don't want to talk about facts that I don't know anything okay. uh, about. My study, 1975, I can tell you. First 10 years, accidents went up. That's the, that's the offsetting behavior part of this, okay? But I, I want to emphasize here more the natural progress. What's, what's in part going on, it may even be the biggest part of what's going on, is people get more educated, the society grows generally, the demand for safety goes up, just as it did before you had regulation. Uh, it is unthinkable that we would have cars sold today without seat belts. Whether we had the regulation or not, people just want more safety than they did in that uh, uh, era. So there's some mix of these two things going on. You can't tell the world under regulation from the world without regulation because both of these things are uh, going on uh, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the world with regulation. There is an important difference. This is what, what, I, what I want to emphasize. The second period of progress occurred when safety became regulated. This allows the regulator to claim that there's been a benefit. And they do. This again, I just ripped this off of the website of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, it, it, it purports to show the life saved by having belts and airbags. And you see, 
multi-thousands and it's going up. Uh, how does that jive with the picture that I just showed you? Well, what, what's done here, uh, if you just, you don't have to dig very far into the numbers, what's done here is to say, well, we passed some regulation at some point in time, let's start in 1991 in this case, and assume no progress would have happened in the absence of the regulation. And anything that happened after 1991 will say that's, that's, that's due to our great regulation. Okay? Th that, in, in, and you can see the regulator is taking credit for this great increase in, in uh, safety. Uh, this is the sense in which I think that progress can protect and promote regulation. Uh, uh, it, it looks at regulation in a non-economic way. What economic, economists do is they use, always use a counter, what's called counterfactual analysis. The first question you have to ask is, what can we expect to happen if there's no regulation? It's exactly the same question that Adam Smith asked when he was trying to convince you that Agriculture should be invested in before you invest in industry. Uh, he said, the world without that, the, the, the regulation would look this way. And here's what the regulation does. And, and regulation is bad if the outcome is worse than you would expect without the regulation, and it's better if it's better than you would expect with, without the regulation. The rest of the world isn't that rigorous. Regulation is successful if the outcome is better, period. Not better than it otherwise would have been. And it, it is not good, and often it, it's, a, it's the beginning of, of a political pressure for deregulation when the progress disappears. I'll give you two different examples, and that this is all I'm going to, uh, I, will be, I will finish after I give you these two examples. They're examples that I was personally involved with as an academic, and I also spent some time as a, as a bureaucrat uh, uh, a long time ago, and in, in those two guises I came into contact with these two different kinds of regulation. The first one is freight transport. A system where we had detailed regulation for a hundred years, very detailed. What you could charge to move goods, this is uh, uh, goods between cities. What you could charge for those movements. Who could provide the service? What it took to get out of the business if you got permission to be in the business. And so on and so forth. Every reform effort for a hundred years successfully resisted, even though most economists thought that the system should have been changed a very long time before it actually was changed. Suddenly, the 1970s and 1980s, transportation becomes entirely deregulated. Basically, not entirely. Entirely is too strong, but it conveys the flavor. There was a sudden deregulation. Apparently so. The other uh, area is new drug regulation. Here the industry became more regulated in the early 1960s. Uh, this has to do with uh, registering new drugs. Uh, 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 before the 1962 uh, change, you had to prove that the drug was safe. Once you proved that it was safe, you could sell it. In 1962, not only did you have to prove safety, you had to prove what's called efficacy, which means you had to show the regulator that your drug would do what you were about to claim it was going to do. Okay, so that's the effort, that, that was added. And what that does is it increases the cost of developing drugs, and in particular, the big, one big element of the extra cost is that the revenue that you're going to get from the new drug is going to occur later while you're going through the process of convincing the regulator uh, about the, uh, uh, not only the safety, but the efficacy. Uh, 
uh, economists who have studied this, uh, again, I'm among them, but it's not just my conclusion, almost every serious academic analysis of this kind of regulation shows that the costs are much greater than the benefits. But there's been no fundamental change. Just the opposite of freight regulation. So what's the difference? In the case of freight transportation, this, the regulation was seen to fail because the industry failed. Freight transportation fell into crisis in the 1970s. A good part of the railroad industry, which was uh, privately, all privately owned, became bankrupt. It re required massive public subsidies, nationalization of uh, uh, a quarter of the industry, and the previous regulatory system simply couldn't continue. You had to do something different. And when faced with that kind of a crisis, regulation failed, it was done away with. In the case of new drugs, it's much different. This is a, this is a, a, a kind of regulation which, which has costs much greater than benefits in a very direct way. It kills more people than it saves. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Well, think about, think about the underlying trade-off that's going on here. You are extending the testing process. When the testing process is finished, you have another period of time to wait while the regulator evaluates the claim that you want to make. Okay, all of this delays the introduction of new drugs, every single new drug. Okay? For what purpose? To catch Two things, unsafe drugs which may have passed a preliminary safety evaluation but are shown to be unsafe while you're testing them for efficacy. In fact, one of the reasons for the efficacy requirement was precisely to stretch out the testing so you would catch it, uh, 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 some, some bad uh, drugs. Uh, uh, and and the, uh, the empirical issue is if you take every drug, the good, the bad, and the in-between, and you delay them for some time, that's costly in a very direct way. People will be killed who could have been, lives could have been saved by some of these drugs if they had been on the market. And on the other side, you will save some lives that might have been lost because the drug is shown to be unsafe. And the, 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 the again, I don't have, I'm not going to give you detail here. Every serious analysis shows that the cost in terms of lives lost through delayed innovation is much greater. We're talking 10 times as great as any plausible estimate of the lives saved by this regulation. Uh, but the deaths are counterfactual deaths. What's going on? Someone who would not have died if the drug was available earlier dies. That's a counterfactual death. It's saying if the world didn't have the regulation, the minute that somebody applies for a license, even at that point, they, they would go on the market if they didn't, they didn't have to go through the regulatory process. From application, even from that point, forget about everything that happened before, that they never developed some drugs that they might have developed. Even from that point forward, it's a year and a half. Year and a half, every good drug is delayed by a year and a half, at least at a minimum by this process. The number of people who could have been saved die. It's much greater than the number of people who are saved, but it's counterfactual. And the safety benefits are very well publicized, just like that picture I showed you from the Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Every time a drug is shown to have bad effects before it's put on the market, the regulator says, I saved your life. Okay. The people who died without the benefit of the drug uh, as quickly as otherwise, they don't even know who they are. Their survivors don't even know who, who they are in many cases. 
And the important point is, progress continues. New drugs do get to the market, later than they should, but they get to the market. Death, uh, uh, life expectancy goes up a little bit every year. There's no crisis. Okay, it's a public health disaster, but there's no crisis. A disaster in ways that only an economist could perhaps appreciate. Uh, 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 but nevertheless, a disaster. So let me conclude now with three lessons that I would draw from uh, 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 this talk. First of all, old regulation is going to be very hard to remove. Unless you have something like a breakdown of the regulated industry, a clear demonstration that the regulation is, is associated with failed industries and so on and so forth, it's going to be very hard to remove this regulation. You are not going to get rid of the Endangered Species Act. You are not going to get rid of the employment for dis the disabled regulation. You are certainly not going to get rid of auto safety regulation because it's very hard to show that the costs, in, to a lay person, to a non-economist, that the costs are greater than the uh, uh, benefits. Secondly, you should be skeptical about the promise of new regulation. Every time somebody says there's this problem, we should have regulation, you have to expect the intended effects to be offset. And as clever analysts, you should think about what that offset might be to the extent that you can. Very often you can't anticipate what the offset is, but sometimes, as in the three cases I uh, mentioned, it's pretty clear what's going to uh, happen. Uh, and finally, you should be patient. This is back to natural progress. You're often going to get the same benefit that regulation is promising, sometimes more effectively and more completely, if you just wait for natural progress to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to work its way. So that's my talk. Uh, I, I think I took up your whole hour here. Do we have some time? Yeah, maybe five Maybe five minutes. Russia tells me five minutes if somebody else wants to ask. Does anybody want to ask a question? All the way in the back. You better, you need to either, either gonna have to come forward or, or no. Yes. Uh, there's a mic coming to it. Thank you for your talk. You're quite welcome. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, this, uh, the uh, discriminate, uh, anti discriminatory act yes. for, for um, to protect the rights of disabled. Uh, so I'm not sure about the US, but some countries have seem to take this um, act a little further by forcing some companies, some employers to have some share of their employees to be disabled. For example, we've met, I've known some companies that, for example, that have to have, for example, about 1% of their employees have to be disabled, for example. Yes. Do you think there are there, if such regulations are in place? Um, there, would, there, would you imagine there might be some uh, offset, uh, offsets okay, to so such regulations? I, I actually hadn't heard of these laws, but it's a, it's a logical outcome of the offsetting behavior that I've talked about. The regulator wakes up one day and says, this isn't working. This isn't working, they're not, they're not only not hired, there's fewer of these people hired, let's have a quota, okay? Well, of course that's gonna to lead to other offices. That's, that's my, very, my point. You're going to have to now think of, well, how are you going to evade this regulation, right? There's many ways you can. You move the operation to some place that doesn't have this regulation. You substitute generally capital, which you don't have, which there's no discrimination law about, for labor, and on and on and on. You're going to induce, now again, it's an empirical question whether 
adding that regulation on balance will increase or decrease the hiring of uh, disabled people. But you shouldn't say, because the first regulation didn't produce the desired outcome, adding the other one will automatically do it, right? Uh, in thinking about why they did, why they have these laws, you know, now you, 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 you can see why the first one is not, it leaves, you, it leaves you a margin of response, which the second regulation is trying to cut off, and now there are gonna be other margins of response that are going to be, uh, are going to be affected in an offsetting manner. And I don't know what the I don't know what the bottom line is. I don't know what the bottom line is. Uh, a quota system, for example, will put a high premium on having. If they you say I've got to hire them and I've got to pay them the same, I'm going to look for the most experienced, the most productive one. It's going to make the youth unemployment business worse. I can tell you that. You know, there are many margins of response. Uh, but I'm interested to hear that because, as I said, it's a logical outcome of the particular effect that I, I, I was talking about. Anybody back there? One more after this? Sure. Oh, this is it. Okay, so you're the last question. Okay. Make it good. Question, <laughs> um, my, not a question, it's my comment. Uh, about drugs. Um, I think that uh, the state has, is liable to the public. Uh, so uh, it can't uh, uh, make accessible all the drugs without any check. Okay. At first. So I think that states should be much faster, and that's the uh, result of this problem. And not several, it shouldn't take several years. As I said, these are empirical questions. There are benefits and there are costs. It's the way you should think about all regulation. There are benefits and costs. Making the statement, it is desirable to have the state certify drugs in a vacuum is meaningless. It's going to have benefits, it's going to have costs. Uh, the, the system that, that was in place before didn't have no state involvement. It simply said, you have to prove safety. That's what you have to prove. You can advertise anything that you want, but you don't have to prove it to us. You have to prove it to the doctors or the patients or whatever it is. The current system says you have to prove it to us before you can sell it to the doctors. Okay. This has lots of effects. Yeah. One of them is it necessarily makes the time to market greater than it otherwise would be. Okay? I think there's a uh, cost to that. Yeah. Uh, the, to the uh, purpose that the um, regulation should, uh, could have good outcome to, for, for the society, yeah, it's uh, uh, by managing its effective implementation. Uh, I mean, uh, in that case, in the case of drugs, uh, if uh, a state takes, uh, if the state takes uh, several years to check uh, if it's available for the public, it's too high um, period. I think it should be much How, less. What should the period be? I think it should be several months. Several months. And in that time, in that time, the minute that the drug company goes to Washington and says, I want it's called, it's called stage three of the processes in technology. I want, here's, here's my evidence, I want to get the right to sell this drug. Without the regulation, they'd be on the market that day because they think that they've proved efficacy, okay? Forget the requirement that they prove efficacy, which is costly and it's gonna take year, it takes five years or extra, our best estimate. That point, you said six months. Where did you get six months from? Where'd that come from? Well, I, should, I think they should see... Uh, where, where, to answer my question, where did you get six months from? Well, uh, it uh, shouldn't be six months. It, it can be any... Uh, it should I be tomorrow. It's, it's, but it is uh, not going to be. The issue is so be. important that state should be more... Uh, you, that's what you say. The fact is, yeah. in that six months, Ten times as many people are going to die as are going to be saved by that six months. That's the fact. 
you cannot answer these questions from first principles. You have to look at the facts, right? And as long as you said, if you said six days, you would still have an empirical conundrum, an empirical puzzle that you would have to solve. That's the way I want you to think about, about all of these forms of regulation. You can't just say the state should do this. You know, somehow that's what they should do. Yeah, or they should do it better. Of course they should do it better. Better is better than worse. But, but as, for, as well, if they, did it, if they did it as well as you want them to do it, there would be a cost. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much. Now we can have a coffee break and then we can... Thank you very much. Washer wants me to hurry up with the second. I don't know if I can make it much faster than the first one, but uh, it's a different, somewhat different subject, although obviously related. Uh, the title is The Inevitable Growth of Government with a Question Mark. So, so may I ask a question about the first uh, half? No, you can't ask a question about the first thing. That's finished. <laughs> We're only going to talk about the second <laughs> Uh, this is also about government intervention. Uh, uh, there'll be a connection, but uh, the question is, will, it get, will there be more or less? That's the basic question. Uh, I'm going to go into some history. Uh, 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 I'll start with the very recent, it's not even history, it's the period we're living through now, which is the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, sometimes called the Great Recession, and then I'll go back to the earlier history. Uh, 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 I'm going to ask why did we get here and where might we be going? So that's the, the overview. Again, some warning. Uh, uh, I'm going to be focusing heavily on the fraction of GDP that's in the government budget as a, my measure of uh, government I intervention. Obviously, from the first talk, you know regulation is also important, and I will discuss regulation, but the emphasis will be on another measure, uh, uh, and then I'll talk about how it's related to regulation uh, as I go on. Uh, again, I'm going to be focusing here on parts of the world that are different than your experience. I'm going to be talking about the developed West, especially the United States, but uh, also, uh, 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 let's say, Western Europe, the European Union uh, in its original form, and so forth. Uh, uh, I'm going to emphasize facts. Again, and this is similar to my first talk. I think facts are more important than what you might think should be or shouldn't be. Uh, 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 and I'm going to be talking about more or less long-run trends. It's very tempting for a guy as old as I am to talk about really long-run trends because I'm not going to be around if they don't work out. To, you know, if I talk about 25 years, something like that, you're not going to be able to say 25 years from now to me <laughs> that I was wrong. So uh, for that uh, uh, reason, I focus, uh, for no other, I focus on the long run. So let's start with the, today, government in the uh, Great Recession. And I'm going to be looking at four kinds of developed economies. Uh, uh, they're listed here roughly in the order of their historical size of government. You'll see that these proportions have changed over time, but think about the advanced welfare states in Scandinavia as being at one extreme. The United States among developed countries is at another extreme. Historically, it's changing, but we have the smallest government sector. And in between, you have uh, 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 the UK would be one that's closer to the United States, and continental Europe. Uh, it's going to be, in this case, France and Germany I could add a few other countries, but we'll just look at those two big ones, which is uh, closer to the uh, Scandinavian 
uh, uh, countries in terms of the size of a government. Uh, if you look at these four groupings, there's been an enormous expansion in the size of government uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Here are the facts. Every one of these, starting with the US on the left and Scandinavia to the right, has seen the government sector expand faster than the economy uh, uh, by substantial amounts, historically speaking. Uh, jumps of five points or thereabouts are not, you can see, are not uncommon, five percentage points. In the case of the US, for example, from 37 to 43 percent of GDP. Uh, in terms of government uh, uh, spending. This is a very rapid rate of uh, growth. Historically, it occurs, you can see, in uh, three years. Uh, 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 the first question I want to address is, is this just the end of a long process in terms of the longer history? Is this just some of the continuation of past trends? And the answer is mixed. The answer is yes and no. There's some aspects of the history that would lead you to not be surprised by what's happened recently, others that would. And let me explain. Let me tell the history briefly of the, again, in the context of these four developed uh, groups of countries about what happened to the size of government. Around 1950, I'll start the story, governments are spending around 20% of GDP. In all these groups, the one exception is, in, is the UK, which is the brown one, which is closer to 30 than to 20. This is a, a, a time when Britain is liquidating its empire, so that's one reason. And it also was the first, uh, uh, even before the Scandinavians got into the business, the first welfare state. Uh, over the next uh, 30 years or so, there's a substantial growth. This is the yes part of the story. This is not, the, what's happened recently is not entirely unprecedented. Here is, uh, here is what happens. Governments start out in the 20s, by 1970, they're in the 30s. By 1980, in the 40s, on average, with the Scandinavian welfare states in their, uh, in their peak development into the 50s. Substantial growth in a, in a relatively short period of time. But then it stops. 1980 proves to be a turning point. It doesn't stop just in the U.S. where Reagan became president, or the U.K. where Thatcher became prime minister, it stops everywhere. So here's what happens to the dawn of the Great Recession. You can see it's flat. It doesn't go down, but it suddenly stops. And you can see uh, the extreme, okay, the welfare states in Scandinavia actually start to go down as a fraction of uh, GDP. But, uh, you know, on balance, you could say in 1980 it's in the 40s, and in, 19, in 2007 it's in the 40s, with exceptions. Uh, the U.S. is a little bit below 40, and so on and so forth. But you can see it's flat. Uh, so that's interesting. And you, know, you can see here's the growth rates. This is the difference between GDP and spending, and you can see everywhere it's generously... Uh, positive in the Scandinavian case all the way on the right. Government is growing 3% per year compounded faster than the economy is growing. Okay, And then it's, you can see it goes to zero or negative for the next uh, 30 years. So it's more dramatic in this picture. So what, that, what we have to ask now is if you want to know about the future, is it going to be more like the first part of this period or the second part, or the third, for that matter? Is it going to be like what we just saw, where there's no growth? Is it going to be even 
negative growth? Or is it going to be like what we've seen recently, which is back to the future, it's, which is what, what it was before 1980? Uh, to, uh, to understand where we're going, you have to ask, why did we just stop growing around 1980? Uh, are those forces still important today? And are there any no new forces that have arisen that we should, uh, we should uh, consider? Uh, and I'm going to discuss these three questions uh, by focusing on three sources of change. And you'll see they're related in particular ways. I, I call them ideology, interest, and technology. You'll see what I mean by that. I'll start with ideology. Uh, and here what I mean is the terms of the political discussion. Okay? I don't mean communism versus capitalism, I mean something more general. What is the political process considering? What's, what's, legitimate, what's a legitimate alternative to be debating in, in, in political uh, uh, discussion? Up to 1980, there was a clear interventionist bias in this dimension. We had, in the typical, this is not your experience in that period, but in the developed West, the, the typical country had a left party and a right party. The left party often called itself socialist, and it was, to a large extent. It was pushing for bigger government, state ownership, classical definition of socialism, state ownership of, the mean, of some of the means of production in any case. And... Uh, uh, when they got elected, that's what they did. As you saw, they increased the size of government, they nationalized some businesses. Uh, the right party's f role in this political debate was to slow things down. Not really to reverse things, but if possible to slow it down. Uh, uh, around 1980, this changes in a very fundamental way, and as I pointed out, not just in a few countries. Uh, France, for example, elected a socialist president in 1980, promptly nationalized the financial sector, and then suddenly gave up, not just the financial sector, but other, other sectors. They reversed, very quickly reversed it. This, this was unprecedented for a left party to do. You find left parties all over the world abandoning socialism. Not the name, they call themselves socialist or labor or whatever, but there are many examples of this. The British Labor Party, the French socialists, the Spanish socialists, the Australian Labor Party, and there's many more examples that one could give. Big ones, India, China, where you have a left party that moves to the right Okay? Calls itself whatever it used to call itself, but the real policy space that they're, that they're occupying has changed in a fundamental uh, way. Now, you want to ask, why did this happen? Uh, uh, one answer is you should look no further than out the back door. Right? Uh, it's true that, that there was trouble in the developed economies. They stop growing. You have this combination of lack of growth and inflation. Uh, uh, you have crises, uh, as you had in the UK in 1980, Scandinavia 10 years later, India a couple of years after that. You have a series of crises in which the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the government has to do something different. Uh, than it had in the past. You also have we academics start to examine critically some of the effects of government intervention. That you saw a little bit of that in the first hour. We have a, a flowering of empirical research that sometimes often shows that costs are greater than the benefits of government intervention, not just the selective cases that I discussed last uh, hour. But I think the collapse of the the Soviet Union is really the crucial ideological, the event in crystallizing the ideological change here. It is very hard f 
for me to explain to you young people what the Soviet model looked like to the intellectual elites in the West in this era that we're talking about now. Soviet, Soviet model was widely admired, not by the man in the street, but by the, the, uh, the intellectual elites in Western society. It was thought to be the wave of the future. You might think that's a little bit funny, but it's true. Uh, uh, there was, a, there was I, I can remember this in my own uh, professional career and as a graduate student. The, the specialists in this area were telling us that, uh, that uh, uh, these were, uh, uh, these were uh, rapidly growing societies. They had, they had, they had uh, developed the, uh, they had cracked the secret of growth. Uh, and it was uncritically accepted. I, I kind of accepted it. Oh yeah, sure, Soviet Union's growing very fast. Until I went there. I went there in the early 1980s. And, you have to question any of this. But this was uncritically accepted in the West, even by very smart people. I want you to read this. Just read this. And here's, here's somebody telling you. It comes from this period that the uh, uh, Soviet Union is rapidly growing. Uh, uh, it's produced economic gains. What, there's the only there's a little problem that it's uh, repressing people. You know, so is it really worth sending people to the gulag for these economic gains? That's the question. And look, and you can see it goes on and he says, "Well, the Soviet model is firmly established in the USSR." When is this? What year do you think this was written? By whom? 1985. This comes from. The chapter on socialist economies in the, the most widely, this is historically the most popular principles of economics text ever uh, sold in the United States and in the world. This 12th edition in 1985 from which I drew this, Paul Samuelson and William Nordhaus. Paul Samuelson is the first American Nobel Prize winner. Bill Nordhaus is a very respected economist still alive. Uh, 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 these are very smart people. They're telling you this kind of stuff. Now, this is five years, six years, seven years later. This, this, this paradigm of rapid growth and economic gain firmly established in a part of the world collapses. This has this, you, the, the, the effect of this event on the way that, that government intervention in the economy generally was discussed cannot be overemphasized. So the, the, the question that arises now in the aftermath of the Great Recession, are we going back? As soon as the financial crisis hit, you start hearing things like, oh, this is the death of capitalism. This is, this is the, this is, all of a sudden we're back to 1985, to the quote on the previous slide. Capitalism failed. We're going to have to replace it with more government intervention. And you have a, a clear Keynesian revival in economics, in the economics profession, and in policy. You saw the first set of facts. There's been an enormous expansion of government. So there's some basis for this. Uh, but I think there's a lot of wish fulfillment going on here. Uh, the reality uh, 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 is different than the wish. The wish is the intellectual elites in the West are exact, in terms of where their heart is, are exactly where Samuelson and Nordhaus were in 1985. Secretly, deep down, admiring anti non capitalist uh, uh, forms of uh, organization and uh, uh, relishing the death of capitalism, not regretting it. But the facts are different, I think. Uh, there has been more spending, more regulation, and uh, 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 
to some extent, stronger left parties. Before 1980, that would have been the unquestioned, complete response. Any negative economic shock would lead to that kind of response. That's not what's happened. That's not what's happened in the Great Recession. We've had the spending, we've had the regulation, but there's no concerted political revival on the left. Maybe the opposite. This is historically a very important point to, to uh, emphasize. Think, my favorite example is, think of all the left parties that moved right in the 30 years or so leading up uh, just before the, uh, the, the financial crisis. Not a one of them, not one, has returned to its roots. If ever they were tempted to do it, the financial crisis and the cheering on from the intellectual elites would have provided the opportunity. But the Chinese Communist Party is not communist. The Indian Congress Party is not Fabian Socialist anymore. The Brazilian Labor Party is not hard left anymore. The British Labor Party has not gone back, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. So in terms of ideology, it hasn't changed. The possible exception, of course, is the US, where the left party won because of the financial crisis, I would argue, and actually did move left, back left. It would move right and move left. We will see how successful that is. Uh, uh, it's already been countered by a loss in the midterm election a couple of years ago. We'll see what happens this year. Uh, why didn't you get this? Why, would, why didn't we go back? Uh, here I want to talk about the role of what I call interest, which is, uh, uh, here's what I mean by the term, the, the question, uh, that's going to define this discussion is, are the voters better off with growing government? Or more precisely, how big is the group for which the answer is clearly yes? Maybe Georgia belongs to this group. Uh, I, I mean, from previous, your previous lecture. Georgia and Georgia, I mean. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that it's not clear what the answer is in the world at large. And in fact, uh, there, an argument can be made, and I'll show you what the argument is, that this group is getting smaller. The, the, the group, not, not of countries, but of people within countries for whom the answer is very clearly yes, that's, that number is uh, shrinking. Uh, the reason that's important is because historically, when you get this, like this, this, this evolution between 1950 and 1980 of a very big growth of government, that's typically concentrated in, in a few programs. It's not just that every little thing the government does grows by 50%. It's that some things grow by 500% and the rest of it grows with the, with the, uh, with the uh, economy. Uh, and I'll give you the most ex important example of this, which clearly is uh, health and uh, uh, pensions. That's been the big growth area in the last, say, 50 uh, 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 years. Maybe education, too. Also education, yes. Yes. But dwarfed by the growth in these uh, pension and, and health, health programs. But you're right, it's also education. Uh, education, and if you, those two together would account for more than all of the growth. Uh, 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 today, if you look at just the social insurance part of this, the health and the pensions, they more than half of government spending in that one area uh, alone. It's in a typical EU country, it's 55% today. Uh, now, as recently as the mid-1990s, it was less than 50%. It's, so it's not only big, it's growing. Uh, uh, and it benefits people mainly my age, not you young folks. You young folks pay. You, you pay and the old folks benefit. And that helps explain why it started growing when it did. It starts growing in the 1930s. 
what's, what's the 1930s? Average life expectancy, which today is around 80 in the typical developed country, is 65. But it's increasing. So social insurance, health, pensions, it's benefiting a small group, but that group can see benefits, and it's a growing group. And the cost is modest. I mean, you know, a typical person lives a couple of years after they retire, not 30 years, as people often do uh, uh, today. Uh, so you're going to pay, you young people pay a tax, and you pay a very small pension to, to a few people who will, quickly, uh, who will quickly stop collecting. But not today. Uh, th this group is large, and it's growing. And the cost is enormous. 55% of the budget is being spent on this kind of stuff. And it's going to keep growing. That 55% number is going to go up. That's for sure if you, if you don't do anything. Uh, so we have now a large group of gainers and also a large group of losers. Okay? Uh, so there's a change. Is it going to affect policy? Well, I, I'm going to argue that it already has. All right? Here is just the health part. This is government spending for health care as a share of the total. Okay? So it's not government spending on health. It's of all the health spending, how much is coming from the government. It's averaged across 20 high-income countries. And it goes back to 1950, which is the starting point of my talk. And you can see that in this period, you can see it stops, this, this line stops growing exactly in 19, right around 1980. So what happens is, the government is increasingly responsible for health care, responding to this calculus of modest kind of uh, costs, a little bit on every, for everybody, to provide social insurance for a few old people who, who benefit from it. Then there are more and more old people and this, this is growing, and then it stops as a fraction of the total. It's not yet rolled back, and health care is still growing faster than the rest of the economy, but the willingness of governments to keep financing more and more of it stopped. In fact, it's gone down a little bit, as you can see. Uh, 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 this pressure for restraint can only grow. Why do I say that? demographic reality. This is the share of the population over 65 uh, in, uh, tw again, 20, this is not just four countries, this is 20 OECD uh, uh, countries projected out to 2020. You see what happens around now? You see that thing take off? We're going to get demographic reality that we cannot really change. We're going to get as much growth in the old folks in the next decade, basically, as we did in the previous 30 years. Okay, this, so the demands on pensions, health care, are going to accelerate from this point forward. And we know from what's going on in Europe right now as we sit here, that governments, even rich ones, have fiscal constraints. They're now about to be tested in a very profound way. I would venture to say that none of what you see here listed is now going to be unthinkable. In fact, it's happening. Less generous government health coverage, signals to the population to rely more on their own saving to finance retirement, increasing ages of, eligibil ages of eligibility for pensions. These have, these have already happened, and they're gonna, they're gonna be pressure for more of this going forward. So that's interest. Interest is gonna be creating great pressure for government not to grow going forward. Let's talk about technology. Uh, technology is one of these things which can go either way. It's, it's, historically, it's been feared because 
to more, uh, uh, we're talking here about information technology, computers, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it's cheaper to enforce regulation. The government can keep following you more easily, puts you into a database and can follow you. Uh, uh, you get stopped for a traffic violation and, and the policeman pushes a button and your whole history can be produced. So that, that's been the traditional fear, that, it, that technology makes it easier to regulate and to tax and to, to, to generally expand the role of government. It also makes it easy to evade the enforcement of taxes and regulation. So that's the other side of it. All right, so here's an example, uh, which, I, uh, which I picked before I came to Georgia. All right. Uh, uh, in the United States, the reason I picked this example, in the United States, it is illegal to bet online. Don't ask me why. You have every right to, as I walk around outside here and see, see what goes on here, you know, what, 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 why do you do this? If you go to the United States, if you have a United States URL, and you type into Google uh, online betting, this is the first page that came up. That's, I, I said I'm gonna pick the first page that comes up. This is the first page that comes up. You get a page which, unlike every other Google page, has no advertisements on it, because Google would be violating US law if it allowed anybody to advertise on its site for online betting, but you can see and it's not too hard to evade this regulation. Uh, this is a, the government ha hasn't been able to, to censor this. And I can bet on almost anything. You can see I can uh, bet on basketball. Well, you don't know what it may be, what NFL, the National Football League. That's our football. This is all American stuff. NBA, well, you know what that is. That's the basketball and so on and so forth. I can bet on anything online. I can use my uh, credit card to do it. I can establish an account, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's uh, technology making it easy to evade regulation. Uh, let me argue that uh, it's very, what is, what's the balance here? I don't know which way it's gonna go. But I do have reason to believe that evasion is, is already a growth business. What's my evidence? So, this is a little bit odd, but you'll see where I'm going. This is a, a, a graph which shows basically how much currency, U.S. currency is in circulation outside our banking system in terms of uh, GDP. So it, what's interesting about this, again, you see 1980 is kind of a turning point. It's going down from 22 days worth of GDP to about 15, which is what you would expect with the development of modern payment technologies. You would expect this thing to go down, but it stops going down and starts going up. You can see in the, after the financial crisis, it, it was going down, now it jumped up again. All right, well, again, I don't have to tell you people part of what is going on. First of all, if we're up to 25 days of GDP. You know what that means? That's $3,000 per person in the United States. Let me assure you that the average kid going to school and the mother going with that kid to maybe shop in the store is not carrying around each one of them $3,000 in their pocket. In fact, they're not carrying one-tenth of that. They, even that would be much more than the typical person is actually carrying for transaction purposes. And the Federal Reserve Banks know this. Their best guess is that two-thirds of this money is circulating outside the United States. Uh, what is, why is it circulating outside the United States? That's my point. In part, to evade one regulation or one tax or another, right? As I'm sure if you have a 
transaction that you wanted to hide from your local authorities. It would not be carried out in paper. It would be carried out in currency, most likely in U.S. dollars. So uh, uh, this growth, it's a, what I'm really emphasizing is the fact that it turned around. That suggests that the evasion is growing. In part, abetted by, uh, aided by the new technology, but clearly there, there is a uh, demand for evasion that is that is growing and will be, in some ways, facilitated by this new technology. And we know that some governments are worried. China is the best example of this. They try to censor the new technology. Will that be successful in the long run? I don't know, but. It, it, the question has clearly has to be raised in light of the fact that the will to evasion seems to be growing. Well, let me now talk a little bit. Do I have enough time? Am I, am I borrowing some time here? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about regulation. Uh, this is another uh, unknown here. Uh, in principle, you can have regulation substitute for government, you know, one way, if we have fiscal constraints, one way to get around them is to reduce spending. The other way is to increase regulation. You just say, whatever it is the government wanted to do with its own money, it's going to make you spend your money for. So I, I use ethanol here as an example, but there's many examples uh, of this. Uh, but it's also complementary. So, so uh, uh, you, 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 you adopt the program, you fund it, and then you impose regulation to make sure that the program can work uh, smoothly. Historically, the latter is the more important effect. So here, here's a typical measure that's often used to measure the intensity of regulation. We have in the U.S. something called the Federal Register. The federal government, every time it, it changes, any regulation has to write it all down and print it in the Federal Register. And so, and the number of pages has been used to measure the intensity of regulation. And you see that historically, in the period from 1950 to 1980, the, the number of pages is growing. This is per person, per million people, as spending is growing. And then when spending goes flat, regulation goes flat. So basically, over the period since 1980, it's been flat. So historically, the two have gone together. They don't have to, uh, and it's not clear uh, 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 which way we're going to, whether this is going to continue going forward. Uh, uh, suppressed spending is going to lead to pressure for more regulation. Okay, so let me end then. I have a. a, a uh, just a, a summary. Uh, unfortunately, I have questions, but no answers. Uh, uh, government has grown in the last few years. That's clear. And it's grown over a much longer perspective. But it also stopped growing for a long time. And uh, uh, two reasons that I've emphasized why that happened was the change in ideology and the change in interest. It's very hard to think of a large program on the horizon that's comparable to pensions and health care that's going to push to a much bigger uh, government. Uh, so, and then the ideology I, I mentioned as well. Uh, I've, I've discussed two other forces which have less clear effects. Technology can go either way. Regulation can go either way in terms of the, uh, uh, facil facilitating or working against expansion of, uh, uh, of uh, government. So where are we going to be uh, when you folks are uh, old? I don't know. But I don't think you're going to have to wait that long for the answer. Okay, so part of what's going on in Europe and to some extent in the United States is the tension in answering this question. Exactly the tension in answering this question. There are pressures to expand. There are pressures not to expand. 
The short run response since 2007 is we'll expand, but we're not going to pay for it. The result is that both Europe and the United States are on, are on unsustainable fiscal paths. And I'd say within the next decade, you will find out whether the expenditures will validate, whether the tax part will validate the expenditures, or whether the expenditures will be brought back to the, the, the level of uh, uh, taxation. But it's not going to go on for, for 40 years, I can tell you that much. So that's it. Uh, my, I'm done. Uh, do, do, do we still have time for questions, or have I borrowed all of my time? No. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, given the uh, level of indebtedness that Western governments or, or, uh, already have, the amount of debt, uh, even if they uh, love to increase the size of government, could they afford it, uh, given the fact that their uh, debt as a percentage of uh, GDP is already 100% in most cases? Yes. If you go back to the first set of slides, which shows the growth since 2007? The answer is no. They either are going to have to raise taxes or they're going to have to bring that, those big spikes back down. And that's going to happen. The capital market's going to force an answer to that question much sooner than before a guy like you gets old. Let me tell you that. I don't know the answer. I don't know. My suspicion, I, just, a, just a suspicion, given I, I think the ideological change is permanent. I think that the, 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 uh, the tension is going to be resolved by reducing the size of the spending side rather than pushing hard on, on uh, uh, taxes. That's my guess. It's just a suspicion. It could go, but it has to go one way or the other. The current system, the current situation is untenable. You've got to ask about this talk, no, not the first one. <laughs> it's very common, it could be... Okay. Uh, do you have uh, any uh, unpredictable but positive results of government regulation? Uh, for the first question. And another one, you said that it uh, happens like kind of miracle when in all over the world uh, some uh, governments to minimize their regulations. Maybe it's, it comes from another, from influence of uh, some uh, politi politics in the United States, for example, Reagan period, and in Europe, so very important was political of Thatcher, uh, because England traditionally was the financial center of Europe. That's the question. Maybe it comes from the influence of this countries of their politics. Let me answer the second question first. I think that's wrong. I think I think uh, uh, it also happened. It also happened in France. It happened in Germany, which have much longer traditions of, of respect for state involvement. It happened in a lot of smaller countries that I haven't included in this. What is interesting about the post 1980 period is not that it stopped growing in the United States and the UK, and that's by the way, continued under Democratic and Republican administrations in the United States and in labor and conservative administrations in the UK. It's not just that Reagan and Thatcher had permanent effects on their countries, it's that the change was widespread. It happened that in they have been influenced in other countries, even like France or why did this? Why did the Socialist Party in France cancel its nationalization? Because to continue with them would have derailed the whole European project. France would have been in an unviable fiscal situation. The negative political effects of that in the French system had nothing to do with Thatcher. Created a revolt in the Socialist Party. And the Socialist Party moved to the center. And it stayed there. The current election in France is being fought in a narrow band in the center. There is 
They, the socialists want higher taxes. They always do. And, and, and the, the right party is saying, well, not so fast, and so on and so forth. But it is not about fundamental values anymore. A socialist candidate for president of France who said, I'm going to nationalize everything, it will be defeated. And that's not just true in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's true, it's true if the Indian Congress Party ran on the platform that, that made it the dominant party for many years in, in India. It's true today in Scandinavia, the advanced welfare states. If the, if the Social Democrats, which have, for the first time, lost two elections in a row, come back in Sweden in the next election, and they say, we want to go back to the old days. 95% replacement for unemployment, for unemployed people. They get guaranteed 95% of their income. They would be defeated by the same population that elected them. So it's much more general much more general than, than, than Lenin did it, uh, this in 20 new economic policy because of competition he had to stay in this yes yes, yes. yes. that's they don't part of the story that's part of the story here sometimes they we have so we have, logical, but they have you, a you, it, it is it, it is no longer possible for one country to say I'm going to go my own socialist way damn the consequences it's best people will leave. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a competition for human capital, there's a competition for physical capital, it's more intense. And so we can discuss the, the facts are that this is a universal tendency. This is the basic reason why, if I have to make a guess, we're not going to be able to validate the size of government uh, today. And now I forgot your first question. Is there some kind of positive, uh, positive... Oh, is there ever a case where benefits of government regulation exceed yes. the cost? Yes. Unpredictable positive. Unpredictable. I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, it depends, on the, your, it depends on your perspective. Take auto safety regulation. If I had to today say, what are the effects of auto safety regulation? Say, on balance, it saves lives. Is it worth it? Then you could say, you could, that's arguable. You could say maybe that's a case where even with, even with everything that I've said negatively about her, it, it is on balance. Uh, the kind of cases where it does tend to clearly have positive benefits on balance are cases where it promotes, it, it, it imposes collective action in a case where the parties would want to have collective action if they could get together. So my favorite example of, of this, a trivial example, but it will illustrate the general point, is uh, you see all these signs on gas stations about the price of uh, gasoline. In the United States, we have sales taxes on gasoline, and uh, they had no regulation at all. And the tendency was for competition to lead to the price X, the tax, being posted. And everybody who, uh, why? Because you say uh, uh, you have a tax inclusive price of three dollars. You, you take the ten percent tax away, and you're at about two seventy. You put up two seventy. The guy across the street puts up three dollars. You're going to go, and then you're going to find out, oh, it's really is three dollars because you have to pay the tax. So if if everybody could get together, they would probably want to have a tax inclusive price because you'll save people the trouble of thinking two seventy plus 10%, that's 297. This guy is 268 plus 226. You just save everybody a lot of what we call transaction costs. So they couldn't get their own act together because there's thousands of gas stations. So the, the government imposed it on them. That's clear. I, you know, it's costly. Of course it has costs. It leads to evasion. All the things that I talked about in the first, but on balance, look, on balance, we're better off really knowing what the price is without doing a lot of a lot of uh, uh, calculation in our heads. That's a trivial example, but uh, it illustrates a more general one about. Uh, you ask yourself, would if you could get together, would you want to do this? And and it's in a lot of the cases I discussed the first hour. The answer is much less than clear whether you would want to do it if you if everybody could get together. Okay. Anybody else?
One last question. I was just wondering uh, if you could maybe comment about, you mentioned demographics at one point. Yes. I mean, the, the growth rates, of course, one of the most obvious reasons to think that it won't be easy to validate the increased size of government. I'm uh, just wondering, just leave that for you to comment on. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're going to see, you're go, what you're going to see now is we have an unsustainable fiscal situation in many Western countries. Enormous pressures to make it worse. 55% now, the, the, the rate of growth of the old age population is about to kick up quite substantially. If you do nothing, you're going to have, you're going to have a crisis that makes what you have today look like a, like a party, you know? The euro will collapse. Everything, every horror you can imagine. So I guess something's going to have to be uh, uh, done about that. And you're quite right that in the traditional alignment of politics, where the old people, they all vote, they all benefit from this, are going to resist fiercely any change in the system. The only way you can get out of it is higher uh, uh, taxes. But there is another way, which is that all you young people have to question whether, on balance, continuing business as it's been done in the past is good for you. You didn't have to ask that 50 years ago. It wasn't a big. It's a big question for you now. Do you want to? Do you want to live in a in a world where your productive years are going to be taxed at marginal rates like 50 percent plus everywhere, no matter where you go in the world? And it's not clear that you can answer yes. And you're going to see, I think, quite fundamental change being on the table at least. As I said, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But it's going to have to be resolved very fast. I mean, those demographics are going to push hard. And you shouldn't look at what's going on today as fiscal, short-term fiscal problem. It is the crystallization of all of these forces that have been left to build and build and build and they're coming to a point where they're gonna force a choice. That we, you know, we try to push it away, but the choice is gonna be forced. So thank you all very much. Uh, uh, talk to all of you and to, to try at least to respond to your very